Our next speaker for the evening is Professor Leanne Tor, who was recently awarded an NHMRC Elizabeth Blackburn um, Award for having the best application for her senior fellowship um, in um, the, all of the applications. So we're very proud to have Leanne both as um, our, the leader of Speech Byte but also as um, the leader of our research uh, group in communication sciences and disorders. Uh, and she's recently been part of um, the, uh, an NHMRC award for a CRC, so that's a research centre in um, improving treatments for aphasia. But I'll let her tell you about that. Uh, welcome, Leanne. Thanks, Tricia, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm always amazed when people come to things after hours. So, and I know we have a mix of academic staff who are obviously tired, they've had a long, hard day, there's clinicians here, there are students, are there students here as well? Yeah. So thank you for coming and for helping us celebrate um, two events really tonight. One is the, uh, well it's not really the 10th anniversary of Speech Bite today, but it's certainly this year and we're very excited and we thought we needed to frankly drink some champagne at some point, so this was as good a time as any. And um, we're also celebrating Speech Pathology Week. Uh, there are hundreds of events happening around the country for that, but clearly this is one of the best. Um, so we're very excited to be able to share with all our speech pathology colleagues around the country and celebrate what speech pathologists do generally. We have an amazing, very broad profession, I've got to say, um, and uh, I, I can talk to that a little bit more when I get to my speech bite talk because that's when we did grapple with just how big speech pathology really is. Um, we didn't realise, I don't think at the time, what, what, where we were going with that. Um, but what I wanted to speak to you about first, we were, we were really, the, 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 the catchphrase at the moment is research translation, translating research into practice. Um, and what, I, what I'm aiming to do for you tonight is to just give a, an example. So I'm not going to go too much into the theory of it or, or define research translation. I'm really just going to tell you what I've done. Um, and so um, as a case example, I'm going to talk about a project that I've been involved with now for some co time called TBI Express. Um, we also wanted to make sure this evening that we covered both paediatric and adult um, content. So the, the, the content of my talk will be about adults with traumatic brain injury. However, people have used TBI Express with children um, and that's fine. Um, so it, it does sort of cover the scope. Um, and I'm particularly wanting, uh, the, the aim of talking tonight is to, to um, for any researchers and students in the room particularly to think about um, thinking beyond the publication of the journal article because that's sadly where a lot of people stop and they don't go any further. Um, and I also want to encourage any clinicians in the room to think about how you can be involved in research um, way before that process happens, hopefully when we're actually planning the research activities. Because if it's going to be vaguely relevant to clinical um, practitioners, they need to have um, some skin in the game from very early on in the project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So um, the field that I specialise in is traumatic brain injury and these are um, unfortunately all too common uh, traumatic brain injuries. You tend to see them almost every day in the news. Um, there are many cases around Australia and, um, and indeed worldwide. And if you have a severe traumatic brain injury, it leads to... Uh, usually long-term, lifelong disability, um, including poorer psych psychosocial outcomes than what we would have expected if the person had not had their injury. Um, and the, those outcomes are largely the result of cognitive, behavioural, um, executive functioning, so being able to problem solve, for example, um, but also communication problems. So we find that at least 
70 per cent of people with severe traumatic brain injury have some form of communication disability arising from their injury. And because of the complexity of the sequelae that happen after a TBI, the treatment requires multidisciplinary care. So uh, I'm not saying this is just a speech pathology program of research that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Nonetheless, speech pathology is very important, a part of it, but it really does require um, all disciplines involved in treating these people. We need to get the patients involved for the treatment to work, particularly their families, which is what I'm going to be talking about, and we obviously want to be re relying on high quality evidence. So given the common nature of cognitive communication problems after TBI, um, there are many treatments available, but um, really in 2004 I published a paper where I trained police officers in how to interact with people with brain injury. And that was the first study worldwide where um, anybody had um, decided to try and train partners in how to interact with people with traumatic brain injury. Um, and really after I published that paper, not much else happened after it. Um, but clearly families were saying that they wanted to know how to interact with their um, loved one with a brain injury. So in uh, 2010, we embarked upon a program called TBI Express, which was designed to find out whether um, does including families and carers and friends and siblings and whoever, whoever wanted to come along, does including them in the treatment um, process improve the communication of the person with brain injury and does it have other outcomes like improved quality of life and improved um, wellbeing. And so the, the program of research really was developed with the clinicians who are working at the coalface. So I met, we had a reference group of clinicians from the brain injury units um, based around Sydney. And we developed this thing called TBI Express, which was a group and individual um, training program that went for 10 weeks. And we had groups of four to five people with brain injury uh, attending the group with their family member or their, um, their carer or whoever they wanted to bring along, who was a regular partner for them. And uh, we assessed the people's conversations immediately prior to the treatment, just at the end of it, and then we did a six-month follow-up at the end of the treatment program. And just to give you a little bit of an overview, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but we had modules of content that we went through um, where we provided aims of the training. We talked about what is a TBI, why does a TBI affect your communication, so some education modules, what are cognitive problems, why are they affecting me in my everyday life. Um, we talked about that person's communication roles and their role in society. If they're a mother, what kind of communication situations do you need to um, be on top of as a mother or as a daughter or as a, an office worker or as a student? So what are your roles and what communication are you needing to be able to engage in those roles? And then we gave them some very specific communication strategies and we taught this to both the family members and the people with brain injury, but uh, the, the focus was really on what the communication partners could learn. So we were teaching them how to foster the communication interactions of people with brain injury. So we taught them to have more collaborative conversations, which involved um, having an, a, a conversation that felt a bit more equal, that they had equal turns, they had equal rights at being able to um, share information we also taught them about how to keep conversations going with a person with brain injury, particularly for those people with brain injury who might be adynamic and have difficulty thinking of what to say. So we helped the family members um, come up with some strategies to, to address those issues, to widen their topic repertoire, for example, and to help them organise and link their ideas while they were talking. So partners were really being trained to scaffold and support those interactions of people with brain injury. We also taught them to think about the kinds of questions they were asking 
of their, of their relative with brain injury? Were they asking them testing questions to test if they could remember what they did last weekend or testing whether they remembered what they did in speech therapy the last time they went, um, which are generally not great as, in, as a conversational you know, tool when you're um, chatting over dinner. So we asked them to think about other questions, being open-ended, being able to ask about the person's feelings and emotions and opinions, um, asking the person real questions that they really didn't know the answer to, um, and asking a, a series of questions to help build topics. And then we had a lot of work on skills and confidence and practicing in everyday activities. There was a lot of recording of uh, conversations and direct feedback on those conversations in their everyday life. So as I've said, there were these three ways to have a good conversation, which we can all use. I've used these many times with my teenage children. Um, and it does help you with your good conversations. So going in with a positive attitude, being enthusiastic, communicating respect. Um, so really thinking about how you present when you have a conversation with your family. Um, these were all uh, very uh, interesting ways. So, for example, how to collaborate in conversation. We have five key elements to collaborating positively in conversation, and that is going in with a collaborative intent. Um, we're doing this conversation together. Um, how can I help you with this? What can I do to make this conversation easier for you? If you've got memory problems, for example, or you're losing track of what we're talking about, Rather than me pointing that out to you or correcting you, how can I help us deal with that? And it's an us thing. We're doing this together. Um, providing emotional support for the person, um, showing interest in what the person's saying, and showing that you're interested in starting a conversation. So we really started to help people identify what were collaborative behaviours and then what were non-collaborative behaviours and trying to increase, obviously, the number of collaborative behaviours that we were seeing. So we did this clinical trial, and I'm not going to go through the details of that because it's kind of, it's a while ago now, but basically, to sum it up in one slide, we did some quantitative work and we did some qualitative work to look at the, whether this treatment worked or not. The good news was, yes, it worked. So it was more effective treating a person with brain injury and their partner together than it was training the person with brain injury on their own. And that was, once again, more effective than just than the controls who got no treatment um, and they didn't improve at all. So we had objective measures, um, including blinded ratings of conversations of the person with brain injury and their family member. We also asked them to complete some um, self ratings of how they thought their communication was going on the Latrobe communication questionnaire and their family member rated the perceived ability of the person with brain injury as well. And we also did a qualitative investigation which I highly recommend um, to examine what people thought of the treatment and what they thought it might have done for, their, for the person's life more broadly. Um, what were the key components of success, for example. And what we found was that people reported uh, some far-reaching effects from this treatment, so that they were having better relationships with the person at the end of the treatment, that they were... The person with brain injury reported regaining their identity again, starting to get a bit more independence, going out and doing things like being able to go to a coffee shop by themselves, um, so their mothers were letting them go a little bit more. Husbands and wives were communicating better uh, in terms of, you know, the, the husbands were being the husbands with brain injury were more able to be able to just in, engage in a, a conversation and not be corrected or cut off at all. They felt future optimism about where they were heading, and they they certainly had more social confidence. So that improved communication. Um, certainly seemed to, from the, from the participants' point of view, seemed to be impacting on their everyday lives. So that was great. And we published the journal articles and, you know, it was good. But at the end of it, happily, I had some money left over from an NHMRC grant. I had $16,000 left. 
And so I was thinking, what can I do with $16,000? Which was a lot of money back then. Um, and so that led me to ask the question, how can I make what I've done accessible to people? How can I make it accessible to people with brain injury, to clinicians, to family members, and accessible outside of Sydney? Because, you know, most people in Sydney had heard about this, but had they heard of it in Belgium? Probably not. So there were three immediate things for me to do. One was to publish the manual, uh, which we did fairly quickly um, because ASBE, which is the Australian Society for the Study of Brain Impairment, um, published it for, for us at cost. Basically, it's the cost of producing it. It's a 420-page manual. It's got all the materials in it that you need to run this. It's got all the handouts, all the PowerPoints. It's got all the background information. It's all there. So we published the manual, and it was one of the early manuals. There's since been a number of uh, materials published through ASBE. Um, we only publish evidence-based materials that have gone through usually NHMRC clinical trials. Um, so they're, they're all excellent. I mean, they're all peer-reviewed. They're not published by ASBE unless they've, they've got a strong evidence base. We also developed a website with the money, and most of the money actually went, Sydney University helped pr produce this um, website for us. Most of the money paid to make some videos. And so we made videos based on some of the transcripts of um, some of the poorer interactions that we saw before the training and then some good interactions after the training. And so we particularly wanted to highlight what being collaborative is all about and what being elaborative is all about. And so these videos give some nice demonstrations of those communication skills. And uh, we also have observation sheets that you can use to watch those videos. They're annotated against the actual script so that you can see particular behaviours. The other thing I was keen to do was to make this more widely available than just in face-to-face -face and or we, one of the feed, uh, areas of feedback we had from our clinical reference group was it's very hard to get groups together of people with brain injury and their families. So what we decided to do was see, can we deliver this, A, just with the person with brain injury and their family member in a face-to-face -face, um, treatment session with the speech pathologist, and can we actually do that on Skype? So Rachel Redake has almost finished her PhD, which is a pilot randomised controlled trial to answer that question. And she's translated TBI Express into a new program called TBI Connect, which is very similar to TBI Express, just the, the delivery options are slightly different. So there are no, there's no group component, it's slightly shorter, and it can be delivered via telehealth or via face-to-face -face delivery. It has the same core content that we had in TBI Express, uh, and the same processes involved in terms of the treatment um, that we would do. So that project, she's finished data collection, she's just about to crack her data. So we're, we're waiting anxiously to get the results. So that was good, but then I'm thinking, how can I ensure that TBI Express is going to be used even more broadly in clinical practice? And this is my lovely Harbour Bridge. So how can we get jump that bridge over to really get it accessible to people? Well, I think there's four key ways we can do this. One is getting, getting our work into international guidelines uh, because guidelines drive policy. So uh, I was invited to be part of a, a project called INCOG, which is the International Cognitive Rehabilitation Guidelines Project. I'm going to just briefly show you some of that. Um, ASHA. Who are the biggest speech pathology, who's the biggest speech pathology organisation in the world? It's ASHA. How many speech pathologists are in the United States of America? 160,000. Okay. I think there's 7,000 of us here. So um, it's, it's like, it's, it's amazing, 
if you've never been to a, an ASHA conference, you've got to go to one one day because it's 15,000 speech pathologists all in the one place. So ASHA was one target I had. The American College of Rehab Medicine was another one. Um, the Canadians, they're, they're seriously into their rehabilitation, so trying to get into their guidelines. So guidelines are a key thing. Make your resources available. Um, so another source of um, being able to do that was I was part of a centre of research excellence for brain injury that we called Moving Ahead. Um, and so there are links to TBI Express on that, which I'll show you. Getting consumers to know about your work is really important because if they know about it, they'll ask for it. And they will drive that process of making people deliberate. Um, if you can uh, think about consumers and consumer organisations and also present your work widely. So it's great to present it at Speech Pathology Australia, it's great to present it here in Australia, but if it's at all possible, think about where else are you going to expose your work? Who else is going to hear about it? So the INCOG guideline uh, was, a, it, it's basically a, an entire issue of the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation, which is uh, one of the top journals in rehabilitation in the web of science. So it's very well read and it's highly cited. And so uh, for researchers and students in the room, that's what you want to try and focus on, is getting your work published in a, a highly cited journal. Uh, there was a panel of international experts that basically argued over wording for two years to get this guideline written. Uh, but uh, and cognitive communication was a, was a paper on its own which I was asked to lead. But what we included in there were some guidelines that um, really focused on working on conversation in everyday contexts, training communication partners, because by that stage we had um, replicated the work that I'd done and in the United Kingdom, for example, so we had enough evidence to, to develop a guideline. Oops, sorry. And we'd also um, talked about the, the importance of groups because most of the evidence is in relation to group treatment. So the TBI Express work contributed to the production of that guideline. Because it was a published guideline, it then got included on the ASHA practice portal, um, which is a freely available, if you've never looked at it, there is a huge amount of information across the entire scope of speech pathology um, research evidence, the, the E3BP that um, Liz uh, spoke about so beautifully, it, they cover those three areas. So papers related to patient perspectives, patients related to the, um, to the environment and then the actual the research, the research perspectives. And um, getting on to something like this, and you can see they've listed speech bite here on the ASHA, it's very little writing, I'm sorry. But um, for those of you who can't see, um, it says speech bite, <laughs> and it links to speech bite, and it says TBI Express Partner Training, and it links to our website. So just getting, getting outreach into that kind of, um, it's almost like getting it into a market, really. Um, the American College of Rehabilitation Medicine is the peak body for all rehab medicine in the, in the United States. So um, I've just co-written the chapter on rehabilitation of social communication impairments that's about to come out. And clearly, they asked me to write it, so and it's gone, but it was with a committee and we've, we've talked about communication partner training as being um, something that people should consider. Uh, and so that will now get involved. They run training programs at every one of their conferences, which happen twice a year. And so the communication partner training will get included in their ACRM training workshops. It's also gone into the Canadian guidelines as well that were published by the Ontario Neurotrauma um, Foundation. Moving ahead has been another way. So. Um, We've been able to list all the tests and treatment manuals that are evidence-based and there is a link there to, to TBI Express. Oops, sorry. Um, so 
getting it out to clinicians is important, but also reaching out to consumers is important too. So when we published TBI Express, I sent a copy of it, I sent the manual to Brain Injury Australia and said, is this something you would consider highlighting on your website? And they said, sure. So it's on the Brain Injury Australia website, the link. Um, this one here, Synapse, is the peak body for New South Wales and Queensland brain injury consumers. And then we have um, this one I stumbled across, Quebec in Canada. They've recommended TBI Express uh, as well. Um, and only yesterday, I was actually on the plane on the way home this time last night, I was just sitting there thinking, this is why I'm a little tired. <laughs> um, I was at Adelaide Oval yesterday because I launched Brain Injury Awareness Week for Brain Injury SA and they asked me to speak about TBI Express. So there were 200 people with brain injury in that room and at the end of it I stood there for an hour with a queue of people saying, mostly asking how can we get access to this kind of training and Brain Injury South Australia provides services to, in the community long term and they were saying, it's all right, we've looked it up, we've just ordered it, we've ordered it, we've got, we've got it, we're going to get it. So they're going to use that in their, in their treatment. So it's just um, going out and talking to consumers can be uh, extremely powerful. And funding agencies. So I've done talks where I care, New South Wales, which are the main funding agency for brain injury rehab of um, people from car accidents, They've come to my training and so now they recommend it on their website for their consumers to say this is something you, you might want to, um, to look out for. Present widely, present outside your discipline. So this was the Royal Australian... Um, no, no. Physicians. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That was physicians. So that was doctors. Um, who were on that same day looking at things about, you know, diabetes and hip fractures and anything else. But they asked me to talk about TBI Express. Um, so some of them went away and <coughs> thought, hmm, I mean, I had a couple of them come up afterwards and go, oh, I've never heard of this. This is very interesting. Might go, but go back and have a think about this. Um, travel overseas. So I've done training with City University in London. Um, I've been on the ABC um, doing conversations with Richard Feidler. So there's, there's lots of ways you can get your work out there. And if you get it out there, others will use it. I've got no idea what that actually says. <laughs> um, and I don't even know where it is. But I think it's Belgium. But uh, if anyone knows, if anyone speaks whatever language that is, uh, do let me know. But my, my, my picture was on it. <laughs> And there's a picture of TBI Express. So someone had usefully done a whole symposium on TBI Express. I've never... It's Dutch. Oh, okay. So it's somewhere in Holland. Thank you. So <laughs> um, people pick it up and run with it. And I think that's fantastic. You know, I just think if you can get other people and you've given them enough information that they can go and spread the word, I think that is really great. So just in summing up about TBI Express and where we're heading... We're, we're going to build some kind of digital health platform to put TBI Connect on. Um, I also want to have a way that we can um, assess conversations online between clinicians and families and have some automated um, feedback about what's going on. And we've come across this program that's been developed by Engineering and IT and the Faculty of Medicine here at Sydney to train the communication skills of doctors in do to medical students. Sorry? <laughs> um, so it's um, led by Professor Raphael Calvo and uh, we're working with them. We've got an honours student working on can we adapt this to measure communication of people with brain injury talking to speech pathology students. That's where we're heading with this because it, it does some nice automatic um, things like percent of speaking time, for example, turn taking, um, things like that. Um, I need to find out whether TBI Express could be delivered in a shorter time frame. Could I summarise, you know, 
what I've done in two hours and someone could go away and practice some of the key ingredients and make a difference. Um, we are building a new communication partner training program with uh, the Hopkins Centre in Queensland and um, I came across this press release that came out last week. Um, this, is, this is the project. So we're going up to do like a train the trainer project with a speech pathologist who came across TBI Express and asked could we use it um, to train workers in the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service in Queensland. Um, and uh, so it'll be a pared down version of TBI Express. So, you know, thinking about adapting what you've done to meet needs, I think, is the other, the other way to go about this. You know, TBI Express can change. So just in finishing talking about TBI Express, I want to just thank my collaborators who've um, worked on this project. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. You probably recognise most of those faces. And also international collaborators. So when, when you get into this world of research translation, you can't just sit here in Lidcombe and do it, or Sydney. You need to get on a plane or communicate in some way to people overseas, because that's, that's where um, you can really start to, to translate your work and, and make things happen. So I'm going to stop there with TBI Express, and I'm going to move on to... What we did through TBI Express was we had a reference group and we met with that reference group kind of a few times a year um, and they certainly looked at the manual along the way and so the manual that was finally published was very different to the one we started with. So they did um, things like you know, coding the handouts so that they matched the session module so that it was easy to find. And, um, and we've adapted things along the way. So we originally published this in a 400-page book, um, but clearly that's not very, you know, it was, it was pre the digital age, really. Um, so, so now it's available on PDF, and, you know, it's got, it's got um, bookmarks throughout so that it's easier to navigate, and that was based on clinician feedback. So um, I've always been very lucky to have feedback from, from clinicians at Westmead and Ryde and Liverpool particularly, um, but also rural clinicians as well, and that really it did change the way that we, you know, what we published. Yeah.